Okay, great. Um, so, welcome back, everyone, for that short break. Um, if you're just joining us, this is the Lotus Civic Museum, and uh, mainly on archiving of literature, like we said, popular culture as an extension. We have been, we are at the Foundation for Contemporary Arts and Conservation. We have had a few panel discussions exploring and different topics. But right now, our focus is on our second keywords and discussion with Judith Poki Boati. So I'll first read her bio and then I will introduce her talk and leave it to her to be her presentation. Then we'll have um, time for question and answer. So Judith Poki Boati is the archivist in charge of the JH Pavna Infitia Archives of the Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana. She is the current chair of the Diversity Task Force of the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives, IEOSA, as well as its ambassador for Ghana and West Africa. Additionally, she serves on the research archives and program committees of IASA. She's a member of the Association of Moving Image Archivists, a member of the AV Think Tank, an initiative of Netherlands Sound Efficient Institute, and a technical committee member of SOI. So today, as part of the symposium, she will be giving a keynote on archives for the people preservation, accessibility, and bringing and bridging the physical and digital divide. So um, thank you, Ms. Judith, for your time, dedication to the archive space and to this program. I'll now leave it into your hands to take us through your presentation and I'll be here as and when you need me to chip in and, and get some questions from the audience. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity and um, um, I want to, I'm sending warm greetings from, um, from the UK. I think there are quite a number of you from here. So I think there has been some kind of an exchange, right? And, and it's such a pleasure to have met some of you. Um, I've met previous um, um, people who have been attached to LOTAD, who have come to the archives and we've done, we had lots of conversations. I recently met Osod, um, which whom I'm seeing right there. And, and I mean, yeah, there's, there's some very interesting things that um, I think views that, that, you know, we share. So it's such a pleasure to present um, on this topic. And I want to thank um, Sylvia um, for creating that special connection between my unit and, and this, and also to Seth for always um, chasing me around and prompting me and trying to, you know, uh, <laughs> ensure that that connection exists. I, I really appreciate that. And thank you all for your time, you know, for this talk. So I, I, I would like you to, um, I think that um, the topic, right? Um, I, I want to thank you again for inviting me to contribute to this discussion on locating the intersection between the digital and physical divide, um, creating accessible decolonized archives, 
libraries and literature for knowledge-based African Renaissance. Yeah, and um, I would like you to permit me to twist the discussion a bit and present on a related topic, which I actually, um, I, I recently presented on the trip here in Oxford. And um, since it is linked to this one, I just wanted, I think, um, there are some critical issues we, uh, that came out out of that, and I would like us to um, probably you to permit me to um, present on a topic which I created that uh, um, which influenced this um, um, this topic you gave me, and um, it is um, actually it actually begins with an anecdote. The collections moved with me. The politics of decolonizing and digitizing African audiovisual archives. So um, I begin by saying that the pervasive, let me, I would like to share my screen. So give me some few seconds um, to just share my screen. Sorry. <laughs> it's not coming. Just a minute, please. But if we do not enable it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does the host has to do something about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are. We are. I'm giving you permission. Okay. No. No, no, no. It's it's uh, screen sharing. Mm -hmm. You sure? Advanced sharing options, multiple participants. Please try. Should I try? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Okay, we can see your screen now. Okay. Okay, so um sorry, so the pervasive call to decolonize the contents in, in African memory institutions coincides with the increasing tendency to safeguard and digitize archival holdings. Um, you will agree with me that recorded sound and images have captured our world. And actually that's where a lot of my interest is in. And uh, our lives that also captured our, our world, our lives and our imaginations. And that the news stories, oral histories, et cetera, that's of course, um, lots of social movements, um, cultural unification, scientific discoveries, and artistic creations have been documented in audiovisual recordings, including film heritage, which um, I recently talked about. More than any other media, these recordings have generated social memory, documented um, contemporary history, and are part of the intangible cultural heritage. So meanwhile, these priceless but fragile heritages are the least cared for in many of our African memory institutions. Unfortunately, many have been left to rot or deteriorate in their original birth state. So this, for instance, is, um, this picture you have on the screen now are the remnants 
of the main broadcasting house when it got burnt in 1988. So all of Ghana's heritage, you know, from post-colonial uh, materials that were collected, films and videos and all these that were stored in, in the space just caught fire just because of a faulty air conditioner. So, I mean, this was not very, this wasn't deliberate, but um, I believe preservation issues were not so much um, um, in, in place. So we lost um, a chunk of that. And um, this, this is also like Ghana's film heritage. I took this picture from the information services department. You know, this is how our films were. As I'm talking to you, we don't even have any of these films um, anymore. I think they've all been burnt. And before this one, um, um, through structural adjustment programs, you know, um, during the PNDC era, a lot of um, state institutions were sold, including Ghana, Ghana films. So we lost almost all our film heritage. All these are gone. It's, it's very sad. And as I talked to you about, um, these are some of the ways you see uh, uh, some of the archival holdings that have been neglected and left to rot. This is just the issue I just raised. So these, uh, these are attributed you know, to a number of factors, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, budgetary constraints or lack of funding, lack of expertise or skilled personnel to manage them or friendly climate conditions. You know, um, because of our climate condition, there's always this, um, um, many, of, many of the tapes are acetate based. So um, you see physical um, deterioration on the, uh, on the tapes like molds, extreme molds, um, sticky share syndromes and all these, you know, very visible on the tapes because of the nature of our weather. So, I mean, in, um, what should work is to always keep these things in, in, in climate controlled environments. But the question is, are, are these taking place? No. So technological obsolescence are also one of the reasons that, I mean, sometimes you see these political reasons and many more. For instance, um, this political uh, party comes into power and um, the next party comes in before this one goes there are some other things they've done that they don't want this new one to see so deliberately they find ways of clearing all that stuff so that sometimes nobody traces anything but so these are some of the things that are happening so um according to um one scholar um whose book i read bradley 2006 he made a, um, a statement that the only way to guarantee the permanence of the contents recorded on analog media is to digitize them. And, and in the words of um, Irina um, Bokova, um, Bokova, captured these words from her, she was a former director general of UNESCO um, who made this speech to commemorate the World Day for Audiovisual Heritage because we thought it's one of the heritages that have been not been addressed to. So she made this, um, in um, 2016, and she admonished cultural institutions that we have less than 15 years to digitize the world's memories deposited on analog formats. So for this reason, since the last end of the last century, the race against time to digitize the largest number of recordings has begun in many advanced countries. And this practice is thereby combating um, these technological obsolescence that I mentioned. It is again halting the degradation of materials and, and offering more access to these materials. Um, this practice and movement has awakened the interests of genuine and false players, not forgetting the markets or vendor dynamics in this whole business of helping to save Africa's um, audiovisual heritage. So this presentation aims to discuss some possible dice, um, intersections and frictions of these um, concurrent tendencies from the point of view of a West African audiovisual archivists through contextual and practical experience. So permit me to use this opportunity to introduce you to the work I do. I, I manage the GH Kwabalankete archives as I, um, I was introduced, uh, which is operated within the University of Ghana, 
which and it is one of the academic resource units of the Institute of African Studies and um, related disciplines. The archive is engaged. Um, so it's, it's located in this fine university. The archive is engaged with preserving Ghana's cultural histories and musical practices. And it provides a valuable resource for local and international students and scholars and creates a site in which broader conversations about the country's cultural legacies are brought into the socio-political discourse. So um, this is the main uh, building, the main Institute of African Studies block. And um, one of the main guiding principles of this archive has been um, um, in Kromer's um, African Genius speech, which um, he taxed the Institute to conduct research in all aspects of cultural studies and the arts and most importantly, to disseminate the findings of these archives, so I, of, of um, these um, researches. So this is actually one of our main motivations um, in Kromer's African Genius speech. And um, so he gave this speech, um, this picture shows him um, opening the institute in 1963 when he gave that speech. And um, the other, um, the archive was named in honor of Professor J. H. Kwabnan in 2015. And it is the realization of over six decades of gathering audio and visual data, acquiring new acquisitions, conducting research and huge preservation efforts. The core collection was amassed by Oanda Nketia during his extensive career, shaping Ghana's cultural policy, building teaching and research institutions and studying music culture and language in, in Africa. So um, in order to reverse the effects of hegemony and decolonize a cover methodology, Prof. Nketiah exerted efforts in strengthening collaboration between the archive and indigenous communities. So um, let, me, let me play a very um, interesting video um, that tells, gives you the background to the archive or, or what's formed the foundation for the Ketia well, archive. Good to see you again. I've been wondering what you could do with Alexana. Professor Kwabana and Ketia is another old friend. So I'm interested in Ghana languages and literature, and I've been collecting material, um, trying to work out something that we can use in school. What kind of material do you collect in the villages? What do you actually do when you go into a village? There's a lot of poetry in song. And uh, in order to get this poetry, we have to do recordings of several types of traditional songs. Cradle songs, songs of warrior organizations, songs of hunters, songs of cows groups, um, songs of recreational bands, and so forth. And uh, when we've done a number of these recordings, we bring them back to our base and do the transcription. Thank you. 
So, um, his um, Nketiah's quest for decolonization is clearly evident, um, you know, in in some of the materials he collected for the archives. He, um, in in an oral interview with him before he passed on, he uh, we, we actually had the opportunity of engaging engaging with him, you know, for several years, and he passed on I think a couple of years ago. He said he wanted to have the whole, almost all the cultures in Ghana in one pot cooked and then you know saved so and and the good thing about him is that many of these recordings um he tried to write about them so uh, many of his books are based on on you know all these um uh, recordings he did from all these um indigenous communities so um again his quest for decolonization is evident in his um convocation speech you know, which he gave in 1963 when we discovered when we were doing it, our digitization program. In it, he stated that African traditional arts should be recorded, they should be preserved, they should be studied. But we should also we but we be, but, um, we believe also that we should not merely be studied, recorded, preserved, but practiced as living arts. We believe also that the arts must develop and that the study of African traditions should inspire creative experiments in the African idiom. And we captured in Ketia, you know, saying this um, here. I'm, I'll just play for just one, one, five seconds. The school of music and drama are deeply committed to African culture, and more especially to the performing arts of Africa. We believe that African traditional arts should be recorded, it should be preserved, it should be studied. But we believe also that it is not merely be studied, recorded, preserved, but practiced as living art. We believe also that the art must develop and that the study of African tradition should inspire creative experiments in the African Yeah. So um, this 1963 quotes above reflects in Kessier's dedication to documenting and preserving African performing arts and histories as part of the decolonization of higher education and knowledge production in Africa, as well as Ghana's efforts in nation building. This vision is captured in his 2016 um, book, which states um, reinstating traditional music in contemporary context, which he wrote at the age of 94, whilst in the service of scholarly study, um, was also a political priority for promoting national integration and consciousness of the African identity undermined by colonialism. The Inketia archives, um, which actually ran, like I managed, continues his vision and work in collecting, preserving, promoting, and disseminating knowledge of not only traditional music, but African traditional arts and connecting histories. So I come back to the initial point I read. But before then, I'll just take you through some pictorial um, tour of the archive. So this is how it started. And yeah, it started with um, all these musical recordings that you watched. And it is located in this space 
at the all sites of the institute. And I am this is just a walk through the repository, a photo, and, and these are some of the spaces within the archive where um, oral history, um, like studio where we record people who have um, some information we need to tap from, the stylization laboratory reference room where you can sit, watch tapes and have lecture on which uh, the materials we have available and listening spaces for some of the recorded materials. This is an oral history studio, you know, and we have all kinds of poly ceremonies, working papers of professors, ephemera, we collect funeral brochures, you know, very um, vintage photos and um, high life recordings and anything connected to um, African traditional arts. So as I said, I've, I want to come back to the initial points I raised reg regarding the growing propensities towards digitization projects. Since the regional funding for digitization activities is minimal or non-existent, it is mostly initiatives from the global north that find such activities in the global south. There is no doubt that these initiatives have saved so much history. However, many of these initiatives are not as generous as portrayed. They are mostly tied to certain conditions. Many of these conditions are, I give you money to digitize, but we share the fruits of the digital outcome of the projects, which is either keeping safety copies in the latest institution for future reference or mirroring every digital file born out of the project on their servers for onward reference by their patrons. Um, the question is, does this kind of gesture fall within the concepts of digital colonialism as raised by or critiqued by some scholars? <laughs> well, that can be discussed on another platform, but um, if we have time, I mean, we can do that on another platform, not now. So there's a, um, a particularly sensitive issue um, has been the demand, you know, to make a repository available in the country of the core preaching partner, which does not only imply a loss of control over the, the digital dissemination of the material, but also weakens the position of local archival institutions. Example, reduced number of visitors, contacts and funding in our own environment. Are these conditions set by the middlemen or the real funding institutions? Even, even where such conditions do not exist, there is an increasing need to reconsider the role of well-meaning agents, middlemen and women, archivists, musicologists or cultural anthropologists who are usually employed as technical advisors or scholarly coordinators to accompany or supervise preservation initiatives. What are their rights? That's the question. Their limits, motives, and benefits within such digitization schemes. In an extreme case, which I'm touching on in this presentation, digitized recordings were shifted to an entirely different institution in, 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 in Europe. And this is actually something that relates to my archive and the private archive without our consent and knowledge. While our recalcitrant and benefactor justified this relocation with the immortal phrase used um, for the title I quoted for this presentation. The title and, and it's, it's called, the collections moved with me, you know, and, and, and now they are in my private archive. This was captured in an email um, he sent to me. I, capt I captured this phrase from an email phrase he sent to me. And um, this is a phrase which has haunted me from um, since nine, um, 2014. Unfortunately, I have, I have no choice but to link the story to the Greek um, mythology or Virgilian adage, which many of you might be familiar with. Um, and if I, I quote, it's a state like Timio Danaos, <laughs> Dona Ferentes related to the famous um, Trojan horse, beware of the Greeks, even if they come along with presents. So I, I will just briefly touch on the story, which um, I said my archive encountered some few years ago. There was um, uh, some, um, we had 
um, some of the tapes that Professor Nkiti has recorded in the archive were deteriorating. And um, in a way, um, yeah, preservation issues were not too good around it. So um, the person managing it at the time contacted somebody in Germany to have the materials digitized. And, and this is the person, this is what I'm, 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 I'm saying that is like a middleman. This person came with a German cultural fund, um, which I know didn't really come with conditions. So sometimes these conditions are actually set by the middlemen, as I stated. And then the collections were digitized. Then the contract signed was, oh, collections will be moved to um, a university in, in well, safety copies will be shared in a university in Germany. They did, they left the material, some of the materials with that. It actually wasn't digitization, it was just transferred to digital audio tapes. After whichever decades, um, I take over the position um, you know, of managing the collections. We try to um, get in touch with the um, Germany to find out what the state of the materials are, because they were that. And it's obvious that that's in, in our um, unfriendly weather, sorry, <coughs> for um, acetate-based materials was not, may not be in good condition. So we thought the ones in Germany might be good, sorry. <coughs> we got in touch with this person and the person was bold enough to tell me the collections moved with me. They are in my private archive, you know. So it means that even the institution that we did this um, collaboration with NASA Institute of African Studies and another African Studies Institute in Germany, the materials moved with this man to his private archive. So that institution has even lost it. So with this practical experience, um, I, um, if many institutions now are suffering, you know, because they are like, should we, who should we trust? You know, there are lots of, I mean, trust issues now coming in. We need to digitize, but then um, within our sector uh, or within our region, there are no, you know, running funds or anything that maybe addresses situations like this. And then um, um, government um, budget allocation for such institutions are either non-existent or extremely low. So how do institutions battle with these kinds of things? And, and because the government has sometimes been neglected, you know, um, this very important um, um, activity of um, helping to digitize and all that, this middleman just take advantage um, of these and okay, come in and say, oh, we want to digitize and all that. So I, 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 I have, I would like to just, um, you know, um, try to slow down my presentation and say, or end to say, to ask these questions. Um, to what extent does the introduction or imposition of practices and schemes, which are considered practical and ethical, by some scholars or archivists, but not necessarily by others, undermine the noble aim of decolonization. If you say we are decolonizing, it's a noble, it's a noble um, aim. But then, how do we go and go about it? You know, in 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 a, in a, in, a, in a perfect way. The other question is: Do we? encourage this practice of digitally mirroring digital resources to an entirely different location outside of the local institution's territory in the name of backup or safety copies. As an archivist, this is something that is running through my mind. And what should we do? Should we get a local repository here based somewhere in Africa where these materials will be stored so that Africans can have access to these materials? What do we do? And then how do African heritage institutions identify the true intentions of these middlemen? How do we change or modify this trajectory of conditional funding in relation to digitization projects in our parts of the world? My other question again is how do we create conversations that will lead to the creation or mobilization of regional funds that will give local institutions some technological independence? Because I feel if we get some form of technological independence, 
um, people are able to train here and they should be able to continue with their work. And then their archives turn into models where um, it can also serve other archives as a suffering. So um, I, will, I would like to um, like pause here and open the floor for any discussion. If anybody has any questions, or anybody wants to raise an issue, um, and then let's leave the discussion open. So thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for this um, very enlightening and presentation. I myself have learned a lot, and um, seeing the video of um, Dr. Ekitia was very um, nice because I only knew him as a very old man. So seeing him in his youthful days was very interesting <laughs> for me. Um, the picture that we are seeing is it men? This is just a aside. Is it men dressed as women? <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> These were Jaguar jokers. So right. um, when concert passes started in Ghana, it was mainly men who were like, they were female imp um, impersonators. So they, they, they pose that you all, so you, you hear when you, when you come to the archives and listen to some of the voices like, ah, well, and these are men, you know, they, <laughs> they pose as women and they dress. So this, the one on the left, uh, is they are female impersonators in, in the concert parties. Meanwhile, they are all men, you know. And then the other one showing, these are some of the photos we keep in. The other one there is um, Yana, the one who was um, beheaded. So um, when he was in skin, um, we had that picture. And there's another picture there that's, um, that is a Boatre festival, you know, um, from the central region. Yeah, so... <laughs> Thank you so much for explaining. And, yeah, uh, your, your... some very interesting records as well um, in the archive, very interesting old music, you know. And the archive was also, we've um, inherited Professor John Collins's archive as well. Ghana Bar's archive, you know, has also been donated to us by NYU. They did the digitization and, and generously donated it to the, to the archive. So. I, I, well, let me end by just playing some, some highlight music. Yeah, so um, those are some of the things we have. You know, high life music, so, there's so much in high life music. Sometimes some people come um, doing all kinds of research, but I mean, high life is one thing that you can derive several things from high life music several of them. You only need time to sit in the archives, listen to a few of them, the old, the new, even current um, hip live music and all that, which have um, been collected by the archive. All these are things you can, you can do a lot of study and, and do lots of articles or learn a lot from, you know, especially the young ones who are coming up. And these pictures you see um, were pictures uh, we captured from the later Santa Himmel's funeral. Um, so we have all these fetish priestess also coming in and showcasing their prowess, you know, um, how powerful they are and all that. And, and some of the items used at funerals and all that, you know. So all these are some of the things that I mean, some of the collection highlights, you know, in, in the archive. I, because I didn't have much time, I couldn't go so much into these, but um, I just thought you, I could just run you through all that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a good introduction for people to make their way to the archives itself and see what they can find. So yes, um, thank you for that. And yeah. somehow we to live on <laughs> I'm just here thinking, how did I not know all this existed in this school? And 
that I'm very grateful to you. In your presentation, you have um, spoken about the challenges that exist in the archiving space. You have spoken about um, the innovations that have um, brought us to where we are now, and you've also posed the question of what we can, what can we do, and as we sit here with everything that has been placed before us. So at this point, I would like to open up for questions, and we can only take a few. So if there are any questions among the audience, I just had one quick question. I was wondering how or what role contacts would play in in safeguarding, you know, the collection with you. Or, or does that or does the making of contacts that stipulate things like you can't you can't turn the kind of collection? Does that affect the ability to get funding? Um, yeah, the question is so the sound. Let me, can you come? Maybe please? you can use my microphone. Uh -huh, yes. No. Please use the other one. Okay. Yeah, it was just a quick question. I was wondering what role contracts play in agreements around digitalization and so on and so forth. So, for example, the example you gave us of the, the collection with me, would that be something that could be put in a contract saying, it, you know, that, that whatever is digitalized cannot become a private collection or something along those kinds of lines? I wonder if that makes any difference or not. Um, I guess that was the question. Okay. Yeah, I can answer the question. Should I yes, please. Okay. All right. So um you know, contracts are supposed to guide, you know, or shape the activities of two like these two actors, okay, in 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 this whole like um activity. Okay, so for instance, we sign an agreement that um materials are supposed to um, move, materials are moving from University of Ghana to um, maybe uh, another university, for instance, let's say University of South Africa. And then um, because of that, the Af African studies people think, okay, this is so cool because it's an institutional um, project and institutional contracts, you know, we signed it on institutional basis, okay. So um, I know for the institutes is that, oh, okay, once the contract has been signed, you know, there's a, a certain kind of guide or security, you know, that's, uh, that's it's guarding this whole um, uh, process. At the end of the day, um, the other party defaults and, and does the opposite. So the, main, the most important thing is to be able to trace um, the agreement and say you have defaulted. And this is what and what you should have done. Unfortunately, when I took over the position the um, of an archivist for these materials, we the I think the materials were somewhere, so we tried to I tried to bring all of them together. And it is one particular material that I have set through the entire collection because we put all the collections together and rearranged them. I haven't located that particular um, contract. You see, so. Um, I mean, this is what happened. I mean, how can an institutional collaboration now become an individual collaboration, you see? So um, what we could do, what I should have done was to have traced to the other side and see, okay, what was the, what contract did you do? Because we could have done that. But in this situation, we had received some funding to digitize and we're waiting, we had deadlines. So I had to ignore because um, if we had to pursue it, it was going to, you know, um, it was going to prolong the process and, and delay the digitization of um, the materials that we had um, an opportunity to digitize. Yeah. Thank you so much. There's another question um, here from social media. Actually, from Bradley, who is on our next um, panel. Um, so she's asking, I missed to say, I missed some part of the conversation, but I would like to know how easily accessible is the archive to the ordinary Ghanaian and younger students? Are there any process or procedures, or is it a walk-in? Um, 
Is no. it a walk in availability? Oh, of course. I mean, it's an, it's an archive that is um, supposed to. Um, so if you look at this slide, it says, Who do we serve? It's an academic community. That's the University of Ghana in general, other Ghanaian universities, tertiary institutions, second cycle institutions. So sometimes we have students coming in to come, even just to come and watch recorded storytelling. So they come in buses and all that. And then we also do, um, like we have community outreach where traditional authorities, sometimes these days we do, um, we try to do some kind of repatriation, for instance, um, a particular dance movement that was played some decades ago is recorded and sent back to the palace, right? And then people who created their records, you try to locate their families and then we do some recording. They say, oh, we saw your father here. We saw a picture of your dad. And sometimes we give it to them just to make their family, you know, excited. And then the media, they also come in a lot. These days, um, um, we, you know, when we look at, I, I said the guiding principle of the archive, in Ketia is stated that the archive should be used creatively, you know, so as much as we are giving, um, collecting, preserving, we need to um, also give access for application or for creativity. So we engage a lot with um, um, people who are coming up with music, you know, um, creators, you know, to also use the heritage institutions are also welcome to use it. Um, people, students from foreign universities and all that. And um, for currently now, we don't even charge for, the, for you to use, but um, I think when you need certain materials, you may have to pay for services. Mm -hmm. So that is the next step we are moving to. But now it's easily accessible to everybody. Unfortunately, uh, we just uh, moved our uh, um, database online because we need to rebuild it and put it back. So hopefully very soon you might meet it, you might see our database on the Eugene website because you don't work under you don't, the main archive um, isn't online, it's a library that is online. So our database is mostly hooked to the University of Ghana library catalog. And then you can see all that we have. Um, but if you need uh, materials, you need to contact us through that same um, system. And then um, we can either do we transfer if you, you are not in the country or you can do just walk in, book appointments, and they will give you access to the place. So that's how we work. Do we have another question? Okay, then I okay. Um, I was really interested in the Nana Kwanbeng um idea of the of the archive as a living practice. If you could please go back and read that great. Okay. Um, okay. Um, can you hear this? We in the School of Music and Drama are deeply committed to African culture and more especially to the performing art. We believe that African traditional art should be recorded, it should be preserved, it should be studied. But we believe also that they should not merely be studied, recorded, preserved, but practiced as living art. We believe also that the arts must develop and that the study of African traditions should inspire creative experiments in the African region. We believe further that there is room for creating new cultural synthesis out of African traditions, new cultural synthesis, both African traditions and uh, new techniques and resources from other uh, areas. A happy synthesis however, can only emerge when the creative and sensitive artist is sufficiently and intelligently exposed to the traditions that he brings together in a new artistic synthesis. And while emphasizing African traditions as the foundations on which we build, we don't ignore other traditions which might help the students to enlarge his resources or acquire new techniques or broaden his outlook. Yeah, so <laughs> did you get that? 
Yeah, um, I did. So that was I, there's something I've been thinking about in terms of him talking about we practice and you know, we don't just simply study record um archive, but we practice this as living art, which I find um I mean one my question would be like how do we move you know like these archives into something that's like living but this usually comes off especially like in languages you know people talk a lot about time we connect our languages and all of that in a sense it feels like the archive is trying to operate like how you know the ancients would operate like knowledge so knowledge is something to be gathered and stored away um if i'm to make a traditional like another that i can think of it like performance in the books you know performance goes about Collecting all wisdom, puts it in a pot and tries to, you know, go put it on top of a tree, whereby, you know, for whatever reason, um, yeah, so for whatever reason. But interestingly, like there was a group of people in Sierra Leone, um, these were farmers, they found soapstone figures. And these soapstone figures they found in the head, what they did was they incorporated these into their shrines. So it wasn't like, oh, let's take them, let's build a museum, you know, teach them and people come to. But this was actually incorporated into the fabric of everyday life. So it's something I've been thinking about, like how do we move our archives, you know, like incorporate them in ways that they can be very functional. Um, because I think knowledge in this context, like everything makes sense once it's properly situated in it um cultural framework or its cultural context so um this is why i mean more of a question and also of course that how do we move you know um this money systems into ways that's men of men pretends and it becomes practice as living as yeah is that all <laughs> no it's not yeah. okay that's <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for your that's question. Very interesting question. Yeah, and very a thought provoking. So um, these are, you know, some of the issues or these are some of the ideas that um, uh, this archive has. Honestly, this speech is so heavy. This speech by Nketiah, when we discovered this, I've looked at this several times. It's actually one of my very favorite speeches as much as we made it almost like a guiding principle. It's quite heavy. And always, anytime I play it, it's or read it out, it, it reminds us, you know, of the huge task we have ahead of us. So um, he's not just saying that just should be recorded. Fine, it's one thing. They should be uh, preserved. It's another thing. They should be studied. Fine. But we also have to, as I stated, to use what I mean, you know, for application or to use it creatively. So this is one of the main texts of the archive. Um, it is huge. We know, we know this is what we have to do. Unfortunately, I don't have much staff, you know, we are very much restricted to um, um, staff. We mostly um, work with a lot of interns and, um, but um, in our own way, we've actually been trying to see, um, to, to see, um, find ways of reaching out to people if we uh, we're still digitizing actually so anytime we spot anything that's maybe um, um uh, addresses uh, maybe an individual or somebody is related to an individual just make copies call the person in and let the person listen if possible we make copies and give to him for instance there's this man who plays a prayer or say crunchy he's in the university of ghana he's i think he's the main person who plays Sepharwa, right? He brought it from the village, you know, with him. It was even in Ketia who brought him from the village. So what we what we did was we we found a piece during one of our, you know, preservation and um, digitization facts. And then we quickly, everyone was, I mean, we all got so excited. This is Jose. It is very fast. Jose's style of play is so different, you see? But when we saw that this is also quite different and it was recorded in um, 1958 in our commandant. So we quickly made copies and gave to Osei. Osei came to the archive several times for about two weeks. 
he was just there, always coming to listen to it. So what he, we, we even made a video of him. We don't have time, so I cannot play it. But I made a video of him, of he saying that this has influenced his style of play because what his grandfather taught him was so different, you know, from what um, is in that, and all that he knew was, oh, in my grandfather's style, this is it. Little did I know in 1958 or whatever, this was recorded and this is how the style of play is. So he also infused it into his style of play. The second thing was the Shifufu performance, his um, front on from, okay? Played uh, during the Prempe the Second's reign. This was the only man that was be playing front on from. So Prempe the Second's son, who is called, uh, I think, a confrere Hini of the Santi Hini, came to the archive and said, okay, if you are, if people are say you have unique materials, I am looking for this very important piece, Shifufu's performance. And I'm like, Shifufu, I think I've heard the name, let's check. So we said through the catalog and we, 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 we got the material and luckily it had been digitized. So we made copies and gave to him. He was so excited, you know, out of the, he even sponsored, um, I mean, some, uh, I think he donated uh, some uh, money to us when we were organizing a, a conference. He was so excited. So he took this money um, tape to the palace just to play to the dramas, you know, in the Asante Hines Palace to see how it can influence the current, you know, way they play the materials and reshape it into it. So these are some of the things, you know, we're doing. And I think as artists, we always welcome new ideas um, as to how, how we can properly, you know, shape some of the work we're doing or, or positively um, influence um, your, your, your creative um, initiatives. So thank you very much for that question. Thank you, Ms. Peter. Yes. There's a comment here on the Instagram that says practical culture we need to be a great point and a way to make our history a lasting one. So I guess it's in agreement with the conversation that we are having. So I'll ask the last question just before you go. And my question is what what are, what is the archive for the institution doing to get um, the younger generation interested in archiving and preservation of, of histories and culture and also using it in, in the arts that they produce? And is there like a course someone can do? Are there short programs and workshops on archiving and, and the availability of knowledge that you have to be and apply in popular culture for instance? You have such programs or do you plan to have any such programs? I don't know if there's a degree in archiving for instance at the University of Ghana or if there's a master's degree in such courses. Yeah, yes, there is. Um, I actually, um, you know, uh, I, I'm an old student of the school, University of Ghana is, um, um, how do we call it? Um, African study, uh, sorry, information um, studies department. So they, cover, they have a course called Akava Studies for um, at the master's level. And I know for the, um, they also have um, a diploma course in Akava Studies. And then the degree is mostly like a BA in, in archives. So that is just, but my African study is also trying to do courses, short courses. So I'm trying to see how um, I can also add my voice, you know, to it and then create very short courses for people who um, manage um, archives or um, people, um, I mean, individuals, just even just simple ways of, um, um, preserving photograph or preserving or putting your documents together or you know some something like that but our archive has been actually been involved in in some initiatives i like apart from the local some international initiatives of um hosting conferences those though there's a conference in 2018 where we pushed the um, organizers to um you know do tutorials you know, in archives, for instance. And, and very recent, we're going to host, do another, UNESCO will be sponsoring um, a workshop, will be hosted by us and um, to train audiovisual archivists. You know, so one um, in, the, in the region, 
So hopefully when it, it comes out, um, I will let you know and you can share it on your platform. But one other thing that our archive is, um, is doing, which I'm very excited about, um, has to do with how um, we try to rebrand you know, the archival profession. Because in, in a part of the world, um, a lot of the young people see archives as very dusty places, you know, um, places that, you know, old, dragged. I had did the public lecture in 2018 and I tried to interview University of Ghana students. Um, I did a random, you know, sampling interview and then asked people how they think archives are. Very interesting. I, the, <laughs> the question sorry, is very, very interesting, you know, um, my my grandmother's box, my desk, and you know, old place where things are kept. Everybody sees archives as old places, dusty places, and all that. But but we in Nketiah Archives are trying to just change that perception, you know, by through our own practices. So, for instance, there was a lady who came to work with us some years ago. She did a national service. She was posted there. She was just crying because she's been posted to in an in African state um, in, in in an archives where she thought she hadn't even been there. She thought it's a very dusty place or just crying to her mom and all that because she did admin. Okay. So administration, she thought she was going to work in a bank. Unfortunately, her posting was um, in an archives. So two weeks later, I sent a message, if you are not coming, I'm fixing another person in. So she was forced to come. And then she came in, met all kinds of people coming in, doing you know searches, and then listening, even trying to um, watch to know about her own culture was something so different to her. So I, I, I always try to use this lady's um, example. She's she's somewhere in Europe, Central Europe, doing something on um, heritage studies. You see, meanwhile, her whole perception about archives was so bad. So I, I believe if my fellow archivists are also able to have this mindset, you know, and try to enhance um, our workflows, you know, through making things, even, the, even what we do enticing, I believe the young people will come out and say, I'm, I'm, instead of say, oh, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be this, young people should be able to get up and say, I want to be an archivist, you see? And, and, and I mean, something like that. So I always say, we, we try to make archiving like very sexy, you know, and we need to work more and, 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 and work more towards that. So that we, and once we make our work, workflow sexy, it helps, you know, to make an easy reference to scholars and these creators that we have around us. You know? So thank you. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate everything that you have. You have shown us today and the time you have been to answer the questions. And um, we would first like to give you a round of applause. I didn't hear from also. Also, I did not hear from you. <laughs> oh, um, I, I can say he was listening very attentively and you know, nodding his head. Almost the whole time, so he was he he been here the whole time. <laughs> yeah. So um, right after here we have um, our next panel, and that is analog past hybrid present digital features representation and accessibility of contemporary archives in and out of Africa. And following that will be another keynote by Kobe and Graham, and that will be on pop culture, pigeon, and other strange paths towards social media. Our last event. And um, will also be another keynote by Dr. Frimpong from Dachos University, and he will be talking on thoughts on popular media as exhibition value and fast and contemporary urban archive. So we would like to, because of time, we would like to go quickly into our next panel that we will be.